these two guys of Minnesota sports flowing in their veins. Mackie and Chad on Score North and scorenorth.com. Ah, uh, but today, we don't have Minnesota sports flowing in our veins. We have golf balls, adrenaline, nine irons. It'll be a little, a nine iron will be tough to flow through your veins, I guess. But uh, Three woods. A lot of three woods. woods. Three woods, yeah. The three wood. So, uh, this is Movie Reviews with Mackie and Judd here. I believe this is the 89th movie review we have done since 2020. We have three different sub-genres of the... Mackie and Judd movie review franchise. We have action movie rewind, rom com rewind, and sports movie rewind. And even though I think you guys like Judd, you were kind of like, I don't know, this might be a rom com. This is a sports movie. Like a lot of movies have romantic themes to them. Yeah. Jerry Maguire was 50 50 rom com sports hmm. movie. Hmm. To me, this is like 80% sports movie with some romantic themes to it. But we can fight about that as we get hmm. going here. Tin Cup. From 1996 is the movie today. So how many? T- this is the first time I had ever seen this movie straight through. Shockingly, like mid 90s, this is my wheelhouse for movies, and I somehow had not seen this movie straight through until this week. I saw this one in the theater actually when it came out. Wow! Back when Don and I used to go to more uh, films, I saw this one, and um. This was, you know, keep keep in mind, this was in the Costner heyday of being the sports guy, right? Yeah. Started with Bull Durham probably, but included uh, Tin Cup, included For Love of the Game at some point around there. For Love of the Game. Oh, my gosh. But, I mean, Costner was playing in some way, shape, or form the same type of character with the same aw shucks look. So, yeah, this was, um, well, it'll be fun to to get into statements, but this is one I, I actually hadn't seen since. I saw it in the theater, and at the time, really liked it. Yeah. So, all right, here's the summary of Tin Cup. Roy McAvoy was a golf pro with a bright future, but his rebellious nature and bad attitude cost him everything. Now, working as a golf instructor, he falls for his newest pupil, Dr. Molly Griswold, a psychiatrist who happens to be the girlfriend of PGA Tour star and Roy's rival, David Sims. After he's humiliated by Sims at a celebrity golf tournament, McAvoy decides to make a run for the PGA Tour as well as Molly's heart. 72% on Rotten Tomatoes. The critics, uh, the critics' consensus says this movie was breezy and predictable. Tin Cup is a likable sports comedy that benefits greatly from Kevin Costner's amiable lead performance. $45 million budget turned into $76 million at the box office. Kevin Costner, Rene Russo, Cheech, Don Johnson, Phil Mickelson, all sorts of random. Craig young, Stadler. Young Phil, young Phil, yeah. That was a very young Phil because he's my age. And, of course, gambling already in the <laughs> mid-90s. Of course. Setting the oh, tone my God, for... he's probably in his heyday at that point. <laughs> uh, some production notes for you guys here. Mm-hmm. So Ron Shelton directed this movie. He also directed Bull Durham and White Men Can't Jump. So nice run of sports movies for okay. Ron Shelton. Michelle Pfeiffer was approached before Rene Russo was cast for that role. Hmm. Pierce Brosnan and Alex Baldwin were considered for the part of <laughs> David Sims. Oh, Baldwin. Don Johnson. A- Alec Baldwin would have been good back then in, in that role as the smarmy Don Johnson character. Yeah, I could see that. Kevin Costner trained extensively with Gary McCord to learn how to play golf. As stated in the foreword, uh, Costner wrote for McCord's book, Golf for Dummies. McCord helped Costner develop a swing and a pre-shot routine. And then McCord was heavily featured as a, a contributor yes. in this movie. It's hilarious. Commentator, golfer on the range. And then uh, I, I just made this note, just sort of something for us to talk about, that this movie came out right before the Tiger Woods era blew golf into the stratosphere. So... But you had a nice little run there of like Happy Gilmore was a popular golf movie, yep. and then Tin Cups. So you had a couple nice Happy popular Gilmore. golf movies to get people thinking, and uh, and then Tiger Woods comes along in 1997. So this was this was definitely a, a golden age of golf here with golf, great golf movies, and then Tiger Woods coming in to uh, to elevate everything. So with that, we do statements here to uh, to dive through these movies. So Judd, what's your first statement regarding Tin Cup? So there's a lot to talk about here, but 
since you just talked about Tiger coming around in 97 and then obviously that, you know, golf exploded. This film, I, I had forgotten this, but this film is the last vestige of the era where golfers didn't care what type of shape they were in. If you look at the golfers in this film, you got fat golfers, you got beer belly golfers. I, I mean, Tiger came in and was conditioned like, like an athlete. Mm-hmm. How many of the guys that, that were actually on the PGA tour that participated in this film looked like athletes? They all, uh, that was the nineties, the eighties, you know, to go back to the sixties, Arnold Palmer smoked on the course <laughs> and Jack, Jack was fat at one point. So this is really the last era of where golfers, it was just great. They yeah. just didn't care what they look like. This was the, I mean, John Daly at its peak, right? I mean, smoking yeah. cigarettes and and getting drunk. Like, yeah, it was, it was right up that alley for sure. Yeah, I had the, so I had a similar note that it's just, it's amazing how different golf was before Tiger Woods came along. Not only are all the golfers kind of schleppy looking guys, they all wear like beigey earth tone clothing to yep. yeah. I wrote yep. that down. <laughs> pleated, pleated khakis and stuff. Yeah. It's just kind of comfortable. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny. So guys are also laying up. They're debating on a short par five whether to lay up and play it safe. And now it's like guys are just bombing drives 350 yards and then taking right. seven irons into uh, into short par five. So yeah, it's pretty it's pretty jarring how different golf looked and, and felt. All right, All right, I'll go I'll go next year. I know we don't have our sounder, but uh, I'll go next year. Yeah. My statement is, what the hell is this movie? I, I don't I don't agree Whoa, that wow. this is a sports com. I don't know if this is a rom com. Here here's what I wrote down in my summary of this movie. And we've kind of touched on it in the bio, but I'm gonna rerun I'm gonna rerun this by you, and you guys still tell me what the hell is this movie? Mm-hmm. He he's a hothead golfer. He owes strippers money. He runs a rundown golf course. Who teaches lessons in the dark, by the way. I know it's Texas, so it probably gets super hot, but very weird. You're teaching golf lessons in the dark. I don't really understand that. And then all of a sudden, with next to no backstory, his old college buddy shows up and just says, Hey, come come caddy for me at, at this event. And he like shows him up a little bit, but okay. And now he's going to play in the U.S. Open just so he can prove <laughs> that he can get to this woman. Well, you're like, skipping some very key details here, but I hear you. This movie is one of the messiest movies I've ever seen. I don't know <laughs> what this movie is. I, I I tried to really give it the benefit of the doubt, and I thought at the second half it got okay. it got a little better, okay. but I think this is one of the messiest movies I have ever seen. I can explain this very simply. This is Costner in the 90s doing sports films. His character is very different in some, in some ways, not all from his character uh, as Crash Davis in Bull Durham. But if you go back and watch that film, it's got some of the same things. Back then, Costner could carry a film. So like you're you're looking for like things that make sense, script details and such. Uh 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 we didn't care back then. This was Kevin Costner with the Costner charm doing a sports film. So they started with the, the premise of do you think we could get Kevin Costner to be kind of a disheveled down on his luck professional golfer. Yeah, correct. Yes, yeah. Could he could he carry that? Yeah, exactly. It's could he thing. carry that torch? And the yeah. answer is yes. Now, I had some of the same script questions as Declan did. So I I will defend you on this. I'll answer one of yours uh by saying that the the premise of Don Johnson showing up to the driving range was, "Hey, I've got this event and this is a course that you destroyed back in the day like you he's never seen a better golfer on that course than than uh Roy McAvoy right so but but then my question there is why would okay you're going to play a tournament at a course that you feel like oh man I just I don't know the track as well or or I I know a guy that knows this track really well wouldn't you save that bullet for like a major championship you know like like the the U.S. Open happens to be at this course that we used to tear up in college I want you to caddy for me so I can win the U.S. Open it's a pro am, right? It's like it's a throwaway pro-am. charity pro am. Yes. yes. No, it's, I know. So oh, there yeah, is a no. major loophole there. Is there a, was there a better entry point for those guys to run into each other than him showing up? And no sounder, but do 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 do. Here's my statement. Okay. Yeah. Why? 
why is one of the top PGA Tour professionals hanging out in West Texas? Exactly. That's in my, in my notes. So here's here's the the logistics, the um and the, even like the the logistics of of the gal right. So Costner's driving range is in Bumbleep, West Texas. Literally like tumbleweeds blowing from New Mexico all the way across over to the middle of the state. There's nothing happening on that side of Texas. That's where his driving range is. And this beautiful, smart, charming psychiatrist. Am I wrong on this? Her office is in Downtown. that same neighborhood of West of somewhere yeah. in West Texas, right? Yeah, it, that makes no sense. Yes. Yep. And yep. and uh and Don Johnson, David Sims is his uh, character's name, lives in Houston, which is hours away on the other side of the state. Yep. Which is like, Houston? I can buy the Houston thing, I guess, a little bit. Yep. Especially back in the 90s. Now it's like all the top players live in Florida or California or Scottsdale, right? So he's got a long distance relationship with this gal. Is he just when he shows up on the driving range? Is he just like driving across the state? Is he flying private? How is he getting from Houston to West Texas? And why is he dating a woman that's a psychiatrist in a small town in West Texas? None of it. None of that makes sense. All of that would have seemed to be easily like correctable with the right uh, script, but I don't know. So. My statement off all these points is very simple. I'll get simple. the woo. I'll, I'll play the woo for a okay. transition. That sounds great. I, okay. I have access to that. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we're doing uh, that. We have a little bit of a different setup here today. So, This film, quite simply, didn't age well. And it's because of what I said, which is in 96 with Costner, you just sort of bought the fumbling, bumbling uh, script problems because it was like, yeah, he's playing Crash Davis. I've seen this character before. A lot of us loved... Bull Durham, which I also saw, I think, in 89 in the theater, and it's a great film. But when I watched it again, like, I remembered this being a really fun film. Like, really fun. Like, I in- enjoyed it. It's, fu- it's a fun film. I watched it again, though, and I'm like, okay, we can end this now. I I, I just struggled with a lot of things. Um, I haven't watched Costner films in quite a while. Uh, so, like, I, I just think that it didn't really age well because it was predicated at the time on him and then, like, golf was in a different place as well, as Phil said. So, like, guys laid up because they were fat and smoking and didn't really care, you know, they, or they didn't want to. And so the, the sport has changed. I mean, my God, Jim Nance looks 12 years old. Yeah. Dude, Jim, Jim Nance, Nance looks young, man. So how old was he in this movie? Let's look up Jim Nance here. He's probably 30s, uh, early 30s. God, I forgot how young he was. So he's 64 years old now. A lot of hair back then. So he was in his like, yeah, he's in like his mid thirties. Yeah, it's almost almost. And he looks like he's twenty eight. <laughs> he looks he looks great. He still looks great, quite frankly. Hello, well, no, friends. he looks good, but I mean, he looked really young. But it, <laughs> but at the time, I think I bypassed the the weird stuff more. And now, like to Phil's point and Declan's point, it was like, okay, some of this makes so li- little sense script wise and storyline wise that. It's not as good as I recalled it was. Well, and a, well, a couple things too. Like, there's some Me Too movement stuff in here that would not have oh, really no. flown. You know, <laughs> I, I think like like Roy think? McAvoy would have been heavily canceled in today's society. He spends the entire movie rejecting no for an answer from this woman, yes. like invading her personal space, driving her to like a makeout point. At right. every point, she's physically pushing him away throughout the first hour of this movie. Yep. And he refuses to take no, and he's just like, he's got sweat coming down his chest. He hasn't showered in three days. He's been drinking, you know. So, yeah, I think there's just some certain things in this movie that make you a little uncomfortable based on the last five or, or ten years. Actually, the the shanks part of the movie made me the most uncomfortable. Yeah. Because yep. I have had some serious golf shanks the last two or three years <laughs> off and on. And that, like, the most cringy thing in the movie was when he got the shanks on the driving range of the U.S. Open before oh, the first round. Damn near hit. It's like, oh, my God. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right, Dex. All right, my next statement. Roy McAvoy has to be the worst golfer to ever caddy for of all time. I would hate <laughs> to be this guy's caddy. I would absolutely hate it. I've always kind of thought about, hey, be really cool. I've only recently gotten to golf, really. Like, in the last three years, I've actually really started to play all the time. Now, I do know that being a caddy is, like, a legitimate hard job like you have to know ins and outs of golf 
And as much as I think it's a cool job, I know even if I wanted to study it, I'm probably never going to have the brain since I didn't start playing golf until I was like 27 years old. Well, you mean like if you're going to be a PGA tour caddy, yeah. If you're just going to like caddy at the country club, you're fine. If I can carry a bag for a buddy and my buddy pays me 50 bucks and gives me drinking money. Yeah. That's, that's a diff, that's a different, uh, that's a different story. And most PGA tour caddies started as like elite college golfers or something. And they just couldn't quite make it. Yeah. I mean, even watching a full swing, like watching the relationships between caddies and and those guys, like it's cool. Like it's cool. It would be cool. I think to be a caddy, but to be Roy McAvoy's caddy would be one of the most miserable experiences of all time that meltdown scene where he's trying to qualify and he's just breaking every club over his leg i i would i didn't find that fun i didn't find that entertaining it was infuriating to watch for me (laughs) i did not enjoy that scene one bit so i got a magic caddying form but stay yeah i kind of felt like yeah the where where cheech gets frustrated and walks off he breaks the the driver in the three wood I get that they're trying to portray mcavoy as this loose cannon and the thing that's held him back throughout his entire life as a golfer has been just like he's always got to go for it right they keep saying that he's always even even uh Rene Russo is like I've never been with a man that just goes for it right yeah, yeah. but you're sitting there you're several shots up on the mark to qualify for the U.S. Open there's no like not even the hottest head most like irrational person would hit the shots that he was trying to hit but it was kind of cool that where he breaks every club except for the seven iron. Who are these schleps in these these qualifiers? Are these are good golfers that yeah. play in these qualifiers? Mm-hmm. To beat them with a full bag is difficult, and he's going to beat all of them with a seven iron apparently. Well, and he's here's what makes no sense too, though. He's perpetually broke, and he's going to break every club right. in his bag. Like, what's he just going to do? Go go to the sports store yes. and steal a bag, dude? And like to that point, so once he gets to the U.S. Open, and he's he's sitting there tied for the lead on the 18th hole. All right, I'm going to make one more run at it. I'm going to try this for the fourth straight day, right? And it, and it rolls back into the water. And I think at, at that point, or maybe it was because technically I guess he could have dropped, yes. walked up, dropped, and then made yeah. a par right and got to a playoff. Yep. So once you put a couple balls in the water, he's Whoa. broke, right, as Judd said. Aren't you then thinking, okay, let's – Let's finish fourth place here and yeah. cash a massive check I, so I can change my life. Yes. Like, but even the most stubborn person wouldn't fall victim to the things that he was falling victim to, right? I hated that scene. That ending. <laughs> I hated it. Well, I agree. That that was going to be a statement of mine. I, I thought the it. ending. Let's, let's dive into it. Let's dive into it. The ending sucked. It, it's so <laughs> improbable. It's so, like, illogical and and. You know, for Rene Russo's character to be like, go for it, just go for it. I it was by movie standards, I thought it was bad. Like, I know it's a movie, I know it's supposed to be fun, but I mean, my God, how many times would you, you know, give me another ball? If you hit this one, we're disqualified. You know, I, I agree with that. I, think, I but, thought it was but I bad. think the movie had to be I actually love the ending because the the movie had to be one of two things. He either had to conquer it all take his medicine or say, screw taking your medicine. I'm going to go for it and it's going to work and I'm going to win the U S open. It either had to end like that uh, or it had to end in some Greek tragedy where he just I can't get out of his own that, way where he drowns, where he yeah. goes and dives <laughs> in the water and drowns. I, so I what, would, but what, would, what would the real, like what would your alternate ending have been then that he wins the tournament? Well, that he wins the tournament or that he does. I'm, it's just, it the, was, I don't, if he wins the tournament, it's it's too then the movie's too campy. But he then it's the, too formulaic. But hitting the ball in the water over and over again yeah, and and necessary. Everybody else is going like, "What are you doing?" And she's like, "Go for it! Yeah, this is great." And by the way, too, so she breaks up with Don Johnson's character, and like it's never addressed at all. Like he's, he's totally okay like, with it. He sees her. He's like, "Hey, what's going on? Glad you two are together." Like, what did the they hell? ever like even officially break up? So no, she. she just she, slept with him. She did see. Well, there was actually some good. There was a good callback where early in the movie, in Costner's like ripping Don Johnson up and down to her, basically saying, "Why are you with this douchebag? Right. What are you doing?" And she's like, "Well, I haven't seen any evidence that he treats yeah. old people or children with disrespect." And, and, and so for that, it. and then he and then he uh, he clowns the old guy with the grandson. And those were Costner's oh. parents. Really? In the credits, oh. it said those were cool. Costner's real parents. Oh wow. 
The I mean, the, the the fact the guy shoots, what, a 61 on yeah. day two, right? Does he shoot a 62 or 62, a 62? 62, I think it was. Okay, so it was, a par, it was a par 72, and he, and he shoots a course record on the second day and then decides, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to card a 12 on this final hole to prove a point <laughs> to my moral self. It's crap, dude. Come on. So, okay, uh, just back to, back to the sta- <clears throat> to the statements formula here for a second. I love it. Something else that kind of bugged me about, by the way, real quick. I saw a comment on the, so we created a new podcast feed here. A lot of you have been just listening to these movie reviews on Fridays throughout the summers on the uh, Mackie and Judd podcast feed. So we do have a new podcast feed. It's movie reviews with Mackie and Judd. If you could give us a five-star rating and a positive review, it helps us spread the word about these fun movie reviews. And somebody gave us a low rating I saw this week and said, uh, I was hoping for more, but I just... All you guys do is poke holes in these movies. Well, and so I, I had to stop after three movie reviews. Yes, that is what we do with these. That's the point. If of you're caught off guard, we love yeah. to poke holes in fun rom-coms, action movies, and sports movies. So if that's jarring to you, yeah. we apologize. Maybe there's another movie review podcast you can, you can find. Um, so I think the thing that bothered me the most about his Sunday round wasn't hitting a ball in the water 17 times. It's the fact that he wore logo-less apparel. Dude. Yep. So he he comes yep. out the first three yep. days, <laughs> and he's like, a, he's like a NASCAR, right? He's decked yeah. out. He's got the local you know, barbecue place or whatever, all this stuff. Right. And he's this dude on national TV. I get it's pre-Tiger Woods age, but there are still probably millions of people tuning in for this final round of the U.S. Open. Presumably, at this point, every major golf manufacturer would be lining up to get their logo somewhere on his body, right? A hat, a logo on a shirt, something, right? Because, again, it's national TV, and he's in the final group at the U.S. Open, and he's wearing a plain black golf shirt. Was he even wearing a hat? I think he was just like out there in a plain black. I noticed culture. the same thing though. He went. Why from does he not? Like, why, why? Yeah, you're right. And if you're one of those sponsors and you're like paying his way with, he's driving his Winnebago. You're paying for his gas money to get him to the U.S. Open. In this, pardon my French, ass clown takes all the logos off the shirt for the Sunday. Right. Oh my god. The outfits are incredible, though. Just like. Looking at all of them, I, I, we, I mean, we talked about that briefly, but it's amazing how far <laughs> golf outfits have come from just like khakis and your baggiest cotton polo. Yep. Yeah. You know, like oh, legit God. clothes. Legit, I love by like, the way. Dr- and I, I have a you whole. Still like, love those clothes? No, but I would if if I golfed. It looks comfortable. <laughs> oh, I have no, like a it's whole terrible. spectrum of colors that my OCD fiance like organized by color scheme oh, that are just hanging in my my closet right now that are all like <laughs> updated and newish. But looking at these ones, it's just absolutely hilarious yeah someone get these guys a polyester uh Seriously. like tech fit blend shirt for god's sakes all right are we back to judd here I think? yeah it's back okay. to, to me uh my next statement is this enough already as the as the head of trying to save time on films that drag on every scene doesn't need a soundtrack song to it <laughs> there were I love like, the soundtrack in this movie, though. It's, it's a good but, soundtrack, dude. But at some point in time, we don't need everything. Like we don't need to drive from point A to point B with a soundtrack several times. Okay, I'm all for the soundtrack. I'm fine with it. But they jammed in more soundtrack material that basically filled time that they didn't necessarily need to fill. Just get to, I mean, it's not like this film was unpredictable. It's not like I was on the edge of my couch or my seat when I saw it in the theater. Let's just get to the conclusion at some point in time. Too many songs in the damn movie. I mean, they, so there's 14 tracks listed in the official lot. soundtrack it of felt this like movie. They, it felt like every one of them got in the film. <laughs> Couple of Do we need two Bruce Hornsby songs or would one have exactly. sufficed? Maybe that's the question. Bruce was big back then. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Dex. All right, so actually, when we were just talking about the hat thing, I was going to bring up this guy, but then realize I'll save it for my statement. My statement is, Michael Block's story is 10 times cooler than this story. Uh, you still, gonna go I was going to say, Roy McAvoy is Michael Block, but maybe a little less than, yeah. I would much rather watch a film on Michael Block over watching a Roy McAvoy and watching Tin Cup ever again. Um, you know, in fact, even you guys are talking about the logo as hat, so uh, Block had a hat and it said raw on it. And a lot of people who don't watch a lot of golf assumed raw 
meant the rolling papers that are also based in California. So raw is a big rolling papers supplier. Okay. And everyone thought that's what that had is. No, the raw is actually, it's a golf clubbing thing, I believe, with Titleist that helps, oh. you know, finish clubs and stuff. So it's it's not a not a stoner thing like everyone even else was falling in love with the darling that was Michael Block. But watching Michael Block's story from two weeks ago, and I know we have probably said his name on this podcast more than any of the top five PGA Tour ma- names in the last, like, three years of us uh, rebranding this. I would much rather watch a story and movie on Michael Block than I would watching Tin Cup ever. Well, the, an update here. This is going to mean nothing to people binging this six months later, but Michael Block right now is three holes into his third PGA tournament of the summer here. He's plus one through three holes at the RBC Canadian Open. Right. So he's he's off to the races again. We'll see if yeah. he can avoid finishing Good luck dead to him. last. Like <laughs> Good luck to him with, with the uh, live PGA thing now, too. I'm sure Michael Block will get a lot of chances. I think this well if if he I would say if he makes a cut here his story continues but yeah. if he doesn't it's probably over. So all right my next statement for you guys is Kevin Costner we've kind of touched on this theme but Kevin Costner plays Kevin Costner in every single movie he's in. Mm-hmm. And there's a few actors like this where they just kind of like Harrison Ford pretty much just plays Harrison Ford. Yep. It's Harrison Ford on a spaceship. It's Harrison Ford as an archaeologist who's avoiding Nazis. It's Harrison Ford in a Cessna with a random woman stranded on an island. And in this case, it's just like Kevin Costner playing the same sort of cocky, charming, underdog personality, wears the same khakis in every movie he's ever been in from the late 80s until draft day. So Kevin Costner plays Kevin Costner in pretty much every single movie. Yeah, that's true, especially especially at that time in sports films because all of those sports films were not – Again, they had very little to do with the script. It had to do with Costner. Bull Durham, I think, is special. Like, I love that that film. I think that film worked on every level that they attempted. But, yeah, by this point in time, they were basically like, be Crash Davis again. This time you're a golfer. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I don't disagree. Because you know what? He he does play himself as well in, in uh, Field of Dreams. Yes. Like, that's... The only the only Costner film I've ever seen in which I think he was trying to actually play a character that wasn't him was JFK, or wasn't he in the? Which is a really pretty good film, but I mean he's still Costner. He can't get away from the aw shucks look that that Harrison Ford also has. What about um, wasn't he in like a in the early nineties? I don't want to say the movie because, well, Dances with Wolves, I guess. Yeah. He kind, of plays Kevin, he kind of plays Kevin Costner and dances with wolves. I didn't too. see that movie. Waterworld. That's the one I was thinking of. That bombed, right? Very much so. Yes. Okay. In fact, we might want to add that to the. Oh, that God. No, movie? I think it's really long. It's I, a sci fi. Oh, my God. It's a three hour no. movie. Yeah. No, it's not what? being added to any list. No. What I if we just say watch two hours, any two hours of that movie, and then do the review? Let's talk about so it. You can we'll, skip an we'll hour nego- and do the review. <laughs> we'll negotiate. But um, I've never seen that or Dances with Wolves. Yeah, Dances with Wolves is, uh, I mean, it's a classic, but it's. I don't think it's. I don't think it would fit this format. So, can I real quick? Can I rank the 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 five? I think there's five predominant Kevin Costner, Costner sports movies. Oh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Can yeah, I give I you my rankings? Yeah, see if I think you guys you're gonna agree. have one one really bad one, but go ahead. No, I don't think you. I love all five, for the most part. Okay, no, like they're all that makes one of us. So Bull Durham's number one. Yeah, love it. Field of Dreams, I have number two. Yeah, I don't really like that one that much. I know a lot of people are. I'm not a big down fan. Builders, but draft day is number three for me. Oh God, that that is quintessential Costner. I will yeah. give you that. In fact, you know what? I didn't Screw hate it. draft day. I you know what? I'm going to change this list on the fly. <laughs> Bull Durham number one, draft day number two. That's uh, Costner, yeah. Field of Dreams number three. Yep. Tin Cup four for love of the game five. But wow. I love, but I love for love of the game. I love I'm for sh- love of the game. I just. I was so over Costner by that film. I, I think that's why I'm biased against it. Why? I was just you so, so you don't like so you don't like Costner. Costner's okay, but I'm just saying I was so I mean, he just when you just play the same character over and over in the same type of film. Cause like to your point, when Costner went into different genres and played himself, that's a little bit different. But I mean, this was just this was his heyday of sports films. I think by he throws, he's got, it's a perfect, it's documenting a perfect game. It's weaving in a life story. It's Vin Scully. 
call in the game as I recall. Clear the mechanism. Yeah, I just, (laughs) I don't know. But yeah, I like, uh, Draft Day might be, like if there is a poster child film to explain Costner's career, Draft Day might be it. Had you seen Draft Day until we reviewed it on this show? No. no. Oh, man. But I did enjoy it. I mean, dang it. It's hard to buy, but who cares? It's hilarious. Uh, all right, back to somebody. I don't know. One of you Jed, guys. is it to you? I don't think so. You guys no, it's any, me. Well, what other statements you? do you guys have? I have yeah. one more. Yeah, I just I have one more here. Uh, you guys have to help me out a little bit because as someone who is still recently into golfing, and Phil will probably be the one to answer it. Yeah, uh, I had never. I always have heard this term on the golf course with my own buddies and whatnot, but I didn't hear it. I didn't realize if it came from this movie or not, or if it was around before. I think it's probably the latter, but I just want confirmation. When he's giving the lesson and he says, "Waggle it and let the big dogs eat." Oh, my buddies say we say that all the time. Now, Waggle yeah. is an actual golf company. Did that? Did that? That come from this movie? Was, was that? Well, an wag- actual... No. Well, Waggle. There's two separate things here. Waggling is just like moving right. back and forth. It's been a thing for however long. Yeah. Let the big dog eat in reference to a driver. I don't know if that predates this movie. Did, yeah. Maybe someone but else John, can answer. Did John Daly say that? I can sounds, see him Sounds plausible. That. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't remember it being from this film because I don't remember it being t- that term being tied to this film. I might be wrong, well, but I want many... to say that. I like feel like like driving mile. the ball a, mile, a country mile really wasn't a thing until John Daly, right? Yeah, that's what John, I'm thinking. He's the I first guy right. that came along and was like, "I'm just gonna hit, I'm just gonna pipe everything 300 Smoking, yards, drinking, yeah, oh, 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 oh. fat as can be." Gotta like to, he he was such a great character, but yeah, I don't think it came from this film. I I think the only I think the only 90s golf film that has a ton of phrases that came from it was Happy Gilmore. Just tap it in. It it's Give all it a little tap it. Oh, it. It's all. I love that movie. Hips. That's hilarious. Happy <laughs> Gilmore's great. Bob Barker. The price is Happy wrong, Gilmore. Bob. <laughs> oh man, uh, I got one more here. We can get to the to the ranking category. So CBS missed a major storyline opportunity in this movie. So this director they kept showing, right? Who the hell's this guy? Yeah. Who the hell's this? That this guy's, guy's real. Still around? He's a real director. Yes. Yes. Like for CBS or what? Yes. You know? No, he he was he was because I I didn't know exactly who, who it was at first. So I waited for the credits. It was really the guy at the time who directed CBS's golf coverage. Interesting. Oh, He's cool. a good actor too, man. Pretty good. Yeah. So at no point, unless you guys can correct me here, at no point over that final round, when you've got now Peter Jacobson kind of came down the backstretch there and and uh, swiped uh, what would have been his only major if it had happened in real life. <laughs> but you have, what's his name, David Sims and Roy McAvoy, two former college roommates and college teammates, as it was said earlier in the movie, right? Those guys were like, those guys were the two best players on their college team. Mm-hmm. And the director from CBS the whole weekend is like, this guy, who the hell is this guy, this random guy? <laughs> There wasn't some research assistant, somebody, an intern who could have figured out these guys actually go way back, which makes this story even more incredible. And Jim Nance, of all people. I know. It's, Jim it's, Nance it's would have gotten that story because you talk about it incessantly and you wouldn't shut up. Right. Like, dude, imagine if, like, Michael Block and Brooks Kepka were college teammates and roommates and Good Michael point. Block fell on hard times. And, and like, and then, by the way, and then Michael Block steals Brooks Kepka's girlfriend in the weeks leading up to the major, and now they're going neck and neck down the backstretch, the back nine of a major. I That's think great, CBS would mention some of this stuff. Great point. And in, in fact, I think that in real life, if I'm not mistaken, when he was golfing at the University of Houston, Jim Nance was roommate with Fred Couples. Really? Yeah. Jim Nance was a college golfer who was really good. And it, as you said, just not good enough. And so, yeah, and I think he was he was roommates with couples. Uh, Lance Barrow is the guy who was the director who appeared in the film. Okay. CBS. 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 So uh, I'll let, I'm trying to find a list of the of the golfers that were in this movie. Oh, I've got it. Oh, here we go. Okay. Yeah. You have, maybe you have. Well, here, I'll well, just start. I kept the credits. Okay. Oh, you did you screenshot them? Yep. Yep. Corey you Pavin. Want, go ahead. Corey Pavin, Fred Couples, Lee Jansen, Steve Elkington, Andrew McGee, John John Mahaffey, 
D.A. Weibring, Tom Pertzer, Tommy Armour III, Mike Stanley, don't know him, Howard Twitty, Phil Mickelson, Jerry Pate, Billy Mayfair, John Cook, David Ogren, Jeff Maggart, Blaine McAllister, Bruce Litsky, Gregory Buff White, Jim McLean, and Amy Alcott. I think, well, oh, Amy Alcott. Johnny Miller. Did you list Johnny Miller? Oh, he no, I didn't. And he was in it. Lee yeah, Jansen. He's, he's on the driving range. Yep. J Jansen, okay. I said. But Johnny Miller, I didn't say. And I had forgotten Corey Pavin was considered right before Tiger, really good back then. He was the best. He was one of like the five best golfers in the world. I think he had just won a major. He might have uh, just won, won like the, the 95 U.S. Open or something. I think you're right. So the funny thing about so Johnny Miller was a great commentator for for NBC yep. Golf for all those years and just uh -huh. just would tear these guys apart. And I was like, wait, well, this is a mid '90s golf movie and and. Boy, Johnny Miller's like on the range at a U.S. Open, ready to tear it up. Wow, I didn't realize. And it was all BS. He was in the movie, obviously, but Johnny Miller's last U.S. Open was in 1994. He missed the cut. That was the last major he ever played. Two years after, okay. But he didn't play. But like the previous U.S. Open, he he just played a couple tournaments to say goodbye. Basically, his okay. his last real competitive year was like 1989. Okay. So they just kind of snuck Johnny Miller in for a a cameo of a cameo. And he won the Open with that famous round in, what, like, 72? Let's see here. He won the Open. Uh, well, he won the U.S. Open in 73, and then he won oh, the, open, the Open, the Open the British Open Championship in 76. Yeah, I think the 70, I think the 73 one, though, is the one where he was, I forget what, what the circumstances were, but it was considered one of the more incredible victories of the time. But, yeah, 73, that makes sense. Uh, yeah, there's a whole section on his Wikipedia about the 73 U.S. Open at Oakmont. Yep. He began the fourth and final round in 12th place, six shots behind the four co-leaders, including Arnold Palmer. Hmm. So he passed Nicholas. Let's see, he passed the leading players of the day, including Nicholas, Player, Trevino. Wow. There you go. Yeah. See? All right. Any That's other uh, final here. statements before we get into the rankings here, boys? No. You guys good? You good? No, I'm, I'm good. D disappointed because my memory let me down a bit. That's all I'll say. Yeah. Well, I think okay. there's a there's a lot of mid nineties. The mid nineties was a great stretch of movies, but I'm not I'm not sure how many hold up exactly the way that you would. The Cage ones did. Oh God. The Nicolas Cage ones held up. Damn it. Sort of. Sort of. They're hilarious. Okay, so the first category here on a one to ten scale is the believability of the sports action in this movie. So the most believable sports movies we have reviewed are Little Big League, even though the premise wasn't believable, the actual, like, sports action. Yes. They, I mean, they used a couple of major leaguers. Ken Griffey Jr. was in the mix, Randy Johnson. Yeah. Yes. Jerry Maguire and Mr. Baseball, all above a 7.7. .7. Any Given Sunday, a 7.5. Major League, a 6.2. And at the very bottom, Mighty Ducks and Draft Day, both tied at 2.7. Yeah, the, the crazy, dumb trades that were being made for running backs and linebackers didn't quite add up for for uh, draft day. But, uh, Judd, 1 to 10 scale, the believability of the golf action in this movie. So the plausibility of the storyline obviously was faulty, but the action was very, very good. I'm going to say a 9. I mean, they got, yeah. they got real golfers. Costner is believable for sure. I'm going to say... A nine. I think they actually went to great lengths to make sure it looked good. So yeah, high credit. Yeah, the the you know the drama and the mental part of this movie like infuriates me. But I, I really feel like outside of when he's first trying to qualify or get his game back, when he's like using the baseball bat and the shovel. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Like, we didn't that, talk that, about that. That completely That's outrageous that. scene. Which, by the way, like I was thinking, like man, there's some days I don't have my driver working. I would like to use a baseball bat with that. You golf can't. Ball. Yeah. But I mean, like, you can't that, hit the thing. You can't throw it up. I mean, what's that? Yeah, that whole thing was hilarious. But I. But in terms of like the actual golf. Yeah, I think it was pretty believable. I, I'll give it a solid eight. I'll give it an eight out of ten. Dude, it's a it's a ten for me. Think about this: basically, That's all cool. the golfers in this movie were professional golfers. Right? Yeah, Peter Jacobson, Phil Mickelson, all these guys. So they it wasn't like Happy Gilmore. They had a bunch of schleps in there. This movie had actual top mm -hmm. PGA professionals. You know, Freddie Couples, right? And they had the full CBS broadcast crew plus the director, apparently. Yeah. So I don't know how much more believable it can get outside of the, you know, a guy would never just hit a ball from the fairway right. eight, seven different times. That's more of a script thing. So 
And the only the only two non golfers, Don Johnson and Kevin Costner, looked and acted a lot like PGA Tour yeah. golfers. Yeah. Both were good. Agreed. So it's a boy. I it, I think it's a ten for me. So that makes it a nine. The most believable sports action scenes we have ever reviewed so far, mm-hmm. in, at least in the sports movie, the uh, eight that we've done so far. Okay, the next it's just entertainment value on a one to ten scale. How entertaining was this movie? Major League, a 9. Jerry Maguire and Little Big League, a 7.3. Any Given Sunday, a 7.2. Mighty Ducks, a 7. Draft Day, a 6. Mr. Baseball, a 1.5. Oh, God, that movie was... <laughs> oh, God, it was terrible. That hurt. Um, Entertainment. I mean, I didn't hate it. I didn't like it as much as I recalled. I wasn't, like, um disgusted by it. I'm going to give it a 6.5. Six and a half. Because, I mean, I definitely I definitely found at times it brought some chuckles, and it wasn't certainly the worst sports film I've seen. So, yeah, six and a half. You know, it's funny how we do these reviews, because tip, I typically like to watch them the day before we're doing a review. Um, so I watched it earlier this week, and I originally wrote down, I would care not to ever watch this movie again. Um, I did not enjoy the film. But sometimes we talk out these movies and do our statements, and then I have a little more level-headed. I'm like, oh, okay, you know not as maybe as bad or not maybe even as good as I thought. That being said, I still, my, my take still stands. I don't ever really want to watch this movie again. I would not stop and watch this movie again. If it was on TV wow. for me, I'm going to be harsh here. This is a three out of 10. Wow. I'm gonna give this a three. I do wow. not like this movie. It was so long. It was infuriating to watch him. Now, now we get um, to the truth. The runtime. Wow. Yes. The Judd runtime. Three. Wore you down. Three out of 10. Okay. Wow. So, all right. My base level for Kevin Costner movies, like the worst, the floor. It's like Kirk Cousins. You're gonna get, <laughs> you're gonna get four thousand yards. I, I know wow. I'm gonna get like twenty to thirty touchdown passes. My team's gonna be five hundred. Like, it, there's a very high floor for me for Kevin Costner sports movies. So, so I'm starting there. I love golf. I thought the story was entertaining enough. It's not the best Kevin Costner sports movie. It's a seven for me. Mostly because of Kevin Costner. So I, I ride or die with Kevin Costner is what I'm saying here, which means uh, aggregate. It's a 5.5, making it the second worst sports movie we have reviewed of the eight oh. that we've done Dextra. so far. Yeah, I dragged that, down that thing right down. It's toilet. okay. Everyone has different tastes. Yeah, okay, going down the list here, boys, for our next movie, we're going to go from Sports Movie Rewind back to Rom-Com Rewind for this next one. All right. Forgetting Sarah Marshall. Oh, my God. oh God, I just saw this week. a couple of years ago. Just love this film. Oh, all time amazing film. Forgetting Sarah Marshall from 2008 will be the review next week. Probably legitimately in the like my top 10 favorite movies of all time. It might be in there. <laughs> wow. I think it, it's towards the oh, end frontal. of my top 10. But it is, at the start. it is good. Yeah, yeah, you get. Oh, yeah, you get. Oh, yeah, you get, 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 oh, one, yeah, you get some uh, good stuff in there. Yeah, real good stuff. Ugh. Anyhow, all right, this is Movie Reviews with Mackie and Judd. Please give our podcast feed on Apple a five-star rating and a positive review, and we'll see you next week for Forgetting Sarah Marshall.